Welcome to ID the Future, a podcast about intelligent design and evolution. This is Logan Gage for the CSC out in Washington, D.C., and welcome to another edition of the ID the Future podcast. Thanks for being with us today. And once again, we have on the line Dr. Jay Richards. Welcome, Dr. Richards. Thanks, Logan. Great to be with you again. Great. And Dr. Richards is out at the Acton Institute and is also a senior fellow with Discoveries uh, Center for Science and Culture. And we're happy to have him because, if you remember from our last podcast, he is... His background is in uh, analytic philosophy, and we wanted to ask him some philosophical questions related to ID and falsification today. Dr. Richards, now there are several standards that philosophers of science kind of use Mm -hmm. to determine what is and what isn't science, and uh, they're often referred to as demarcators or demarcation sort of problem here, trying to figure out what is and what isn't science. Right. Now, falsifiability... Is, is often brought up in this regard, and in many, by many of ID's critics, I think, is seen as the gold standard mm-hmm. of how you decide what is and what isn't science. What, yeah. is, what exactly is meant by falsifiability? Well, falsifiability is, it was a criterion that a famous philosopher of science named Karl Popper proposed in a book called The Logic of Scientific Discovery. And he essentially said the way you separate natural science from everything else, which is basically natural science versus metaphysics, you know, which was considered disreputable, is that it, you had to propose something that could be falsified, that is, some kind of hypothesis that you could test in such a way that it could be proved false. And if you couldn't do this, then it wasn't science. Now, Popper proposed this in the context of a great deal of activity in philosophy of science, trying to figure out what were the demarcation criteria that is for demarcating science from everything else. Uh, And it's important to remember that prior to Popper, a lot of people had proposed verification, and there's a great movement called verificationism, Mm -hmm. uh, which essentially said for something to be scientific or even rational in in some ways. Or uh, meaningful. Yeah, or even meaningful in the strongest form (laughs) in the 1930s. It had to be able to be verified empirically or verified by the senses. Of course, that's a self-refuting claim, because if you require that for meaning, then the very claim of verificationism couldn't be empirically verified. So you had all these kinds of conceptual troubles so that either you came up with a criterion that was so promiscuous that it let all sorts of disreputable things in, like religion and metaphysics, of right. course, the verificationist, <laughs> or it was so strict that it excluded chemistry and physics and <laughs> pretty much everything right. else. Or, so Popper yeah. proposed falsification. He said, okay, yeah, there are many things that maybe can't be directly verified, but we should hold this to the standard of falsification. Uh, and what's funny is that's the one sort of form of verificationism that seems to at least occupy occupy the public imagination to the present day. Now, just kind of as an aside, we've, mm-hmm. you know, if those who follow this debate have often heard that Karl Popper, the philosopher that you mentioned earlier, that he basically didn't think Darwinism was very scientific. Is that true? And, and secondly, you know, the second part of this, I don't know if this is an urban legend or not, mm-hmm. and uh, I love, uh, love your take. Some people have said that he criticized Darwinism, then he kind of got some flack Karl Popper, and right. and he kind of recanted and then sort of, you know, held to the, the Darwinian orthodoxy. Is, is this true? Yeah. Well, he did in print at one point describe Darwinism as more metaphysics than science. I'm paraphrasing, essentially because he, he thought it was very difficult to falsify. So he used his own falsification criterion and said, well, how would you falsify it? You propose a Darwinian mechanism and you, you could kind of falsify that one proposal, but maybe something was produced by some other indirect pathway that you didn't think of. And so he... he thought that the way it functioned, it tended to be unfalsifiable, and so therefore more metaphysics and science. But uh, my opinion is that he got a lot of pressure from that, and uh, it was clear that he didn't continue to toe that line. Whether he completely disavowed it or not, I'm not sure. But I do think that the kind of general impression of that is correct, that he, well, his initial impulses, as I think quite rightly, that if you use falsification as a criterion, it's very difficult to get Darwinism to qualify. It's why why is that? Well, it can explain pretty much everything in its opposite equally well, so that if you have a flightless bird, you explain that by Darwinian mechani- mechanisms. If you've got a flying bird, you explain <laughs> that by Darwinian mechanisms. I mean, there's almost nothing, you know, heterosexuality, uh, there's a Darwinian story for that. Homosexuality, there's a Darwinian story for that. Right. And so it ends up being the sort of thing that explains everything in its opposite equally well. And so I do think Popper was on to something uh, with this criterion of falsification, though most philosophers 
professors of science now agree that it's a much too blunt of an instrument to really describe real scientific practice. Hmm. Interesting. And it seems even Richard Dawkins is sort of I, that's the example that comes to my mind in uh, Richard mm-hmm. Dawkins' latest book, The God Delusion, where he he seems to not want to give almost any credit to religion, so he finds kind of a, an end run around, you know, because you would think that the natural uh, Darwinian explanation of a religion would just be to say, well, religion was useful, even if, right. fal- even if false, sure. that's, that's why it evolved. Um, that's but he, right. But he seems unwilling to even, even say that and says, no, well, there's a kind of a third, there are other ways that it could sneak in the back door. Do you know what I mean? It seems the same sort of, I don't know. No, that's right. Yeah, I mean, this is because, yeah, if you'd say uh, on the Darwinian terms, whatever exists, well, there must have provided a survival advantage. Religion proliferates, so it must provide a survival advantage. But if you want to destroy religion and you're an Orthodox Darwinist, you're sort of in a problem there. Because, <laughs> look, if it, you don't have truth, uh, you know, that doesn't, you don't have access to that. All you have is survivability. And if religion provides survivability, then you'd think on Darwinian terms it's, it's just fine. So, right. yeah, Darwin's definitely in a pickle there. Yeah, well, maybe they're, uh, they're trying to win over the, uh, the pragmatists in the middle. <laughs> Yeah, the, in right. the middle, you know, because if uh, if they found out that religion was useful, then they would have to, uh, you know, start adhering no, right. to it. Anyway, yeah, right. <laughs> sorry for the segue, but uh, or the uh, little interlude there. Now, getting back to falsifiability. Sure. Do philosophers of science today tend to think not not just science, not scientists themselves? They seem, yeah. they seem to the Darwinist scientists at least seem to love falsifiability and think that it's the gold standard. But right. do philosophers of science? How, what do they think of the falsifiability uh, criterion these days? In fact, well, in fact, there's very few serious, if any, serious philosophers of science that would now say falsifiability is the criterion by which you demarcate science from non-science. The problem is, if you actually look at the history of science, no scientific theory stands or falls on a single test or prediction. That's just the nature of reality. It's the nature of experimentation. And so you can propose hypotheses, propose various types of tests, but if you have something that seems to falsify your theory, it might be the theory is false. It might be that your way of testing it is wrong or that your data has gotten garbled somehow or that you simply misinterpreted it. And so the reality is is that there's a whole lot more flexibility in the relationship between evidence on the one hand and scientific theorizing on the other. And so if you want to be realistic, you need a finer-tuned set of conditions. And what a lot of philosophers of science would now say is that you want in some way your theory to be empirically testable, so either falsifiable or perhaps verifiable, even if it's not one or the other. And you can think of examples of this, for instance, the, the SETI program, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, is clearly not falsifiable. I mean, there could always be some distant planetary system in which, you know, there exists intelligent alien life, and you just haven't found it yet. On the other hand, the SETI research is clearly verifiable. We find one clear sign of uh, extraterrestrial intelligence will verify the theory, and that's a perfect example. Hmm. And that, I think, is a much more realistic way of thinking about this. You want to think, as philosopher Del Ratch said, you want your theories to be put in empirical harm's way. What kind right. of difference does a theory make about the natural world so that there's some way of testing it and determining whether it's right or wrong? That's a finer-tuned way of putting it and than falsifiability. It's also a much more accurate description of how natural science proceeds seeds in the actual world. Sure. And so then you use a criterion like that, and it turns out that the contemporary intelligent design arguments on that criterion qualify just as well as Darwinism and a lot of other theories. That's the irony of it, because as you said earlier, I mean, falsifiability would clearly seem to disqualify Darwinism itself. Ironically, there are a lot of design theorists that have actually gone above and beyond and actually proposed ways of falsifying their theory. Now, give, well, us, they, give us an example. I mean, now, sure. from, from your own work, as I recall, in uh, The Privileged Planet, which argues for design at sort of a, a cosmological or um, at the level of, you know, basically astronomy yeah. is, is your field, is the subject matter there. Now, what's an example of uh, a way that you could, you know, put it in your, your uh, thesis in empirical harm's way? Yeah. I mean, we pr- basically propose that, this, that uh, the conditions for life are very narrow, so you need a lot of things to go right on a planet for life to exist, and also that when you get all those things for life, for so-called habitability, that you'll also get the best conditions for scientific discovery. And we would just propose in Chapter 16 of the book, here's how to falsify the argument. You find native life around a planet radically different than the Earth. You find life based on a completely different chemistry than carbon and water. You find complex native life on a planet that is otherwise very hostile to scientific discovery, and you've directly contradicted and refuted our argument. These are the kinds of things that we could discover about the natural world. And so even though falsifiability per se 
is it really kind of too high and precise a standard for how science is practiced in general. Almost any contemporary design argument actually proposes falsifiability tests for our own arguments. Mike Behe does the same thing in Darwin's Black Box with his argument for irreducible complexity. Just show how the bacterial flagellum could have been put together uh, in an indirect Darwinian way, and you have refuted his argument at least with respect to the bacterial flagellum. So that's the irony of it, is that a lot of Darwinists are not willing to adhere by the very criterion that they say defeats intelligent design, while design theorists, on the other hand, have been willing actually to leave ourselves open to the scrutiny of the falsifiability criterion. Well, we're going to have to leave it right there today. Thanks so much, Dr. Richards, for your, uh, your time in discussing falsifiability today. Thanks for being with us. You bet.